Good morning, my name is Maria Bryant. I'm going to talk to you today about fixing our food systems. Before I start though, I'd like to begin with a scenario, if I may. I want you all to imagine that you're a parent, you've got young children, but that you live on a very low income. You're, you are working all hours of the day to make ends meet, however, and you rely on schools to provide a hot meal for your children and some social support. But you live in an environment that is surrounded by cheap, low quality food, but food that your children really enjoy. Then COVID hits, you're furloughed or worse still, you lose your job altogether. Now you were only just hanging in there beforehand. And feeding your children in the school holidays has always been a challenge for you. And you often lost money because you had to stop working to look after them. Now the schools are closed, but you don't know how long they're closed for. So my question is, what and how do you feed your children? So you may decide to get some fresh fruit and vegetables from the local store. They're expensive and your children might not eat them. Or you could spend your budget on traveling and go to a larger supermarket to get fresh fruit. Both of these options are more expensive than buying a bucket of fried chicken from the takeaway across the road. And I give you this scenario, not because I want to install any empathy, but really I want us to start thinking about complexity and how much of a complex issue this really is. And the actions that we take, whether they're the personal decision making or a national policy level, very rarely act in isolation. So, for example, government spending in one area is likely to result in cuts in another area. And in our scenario, had you decided to spend your money on fresh fruits and vegetables, might that have meant that you wouldn't have been able to turn your heating on? And even those decisions that feel absolutely positive can often have some negative consequences. So one example of this may be providing free school meals to all children. We currently do this, but only for the first few years of primary schools. I would argue that this is a no brainer. It provides a hot meal for children every day and potentially without any stigma. But when we talk to our head teachers, they tell us what this means is that fewer parents apply for means tested free school meals. And ultimately that has an impact on the funding that they received. And it's this level of complexity that means we need to consider our research on foods as part of a much bigger picture or a food system. So we consider the possible influences and the consequences of all the actions that we take. And this is what we're doing with our work, including a project that we're currently working on called Fix Our Food. Now this project is aiming to transform the whole of the Yorkshire food system. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that towards the end of the presentation. Really importantly though, what we want to do with this is ensure that we develop and test interventions and initiatives that benefit those needing it most. And welfare or food insecurity is certainly an area of our food system that really does need significant transformation. And did you know that we produce over one and a half times the amount of food that we actually need in the UK, uh, sorry, in the globally. But about 10% of the world go hungry. So in 2020, between 700 and 800 million people went hungry. So it's clear that hunger or not having enough access to nutritionally adequate foods is definitely not just caused by scarcity. Again, it's really complex. And in the UK, we saw a doubling of food insecurity since before COVID, so from about eight to 16%. And I'm sad to say that this is often worse in households that have children. And the Trussell Food Trust reported over a 100% rise in emergency food parcels that were specifically for young children. And of course, lockdown impacted many people's lives, but it also highlighted how important our schools are. And actually schools have always provided more than just education, right? So they provide food, exercise, social support, employment opportunities, and they really help our children to form habits and routines. So there's a big impact on when they're closed. So whether due to lockdown or to uh, uh, just regular holiday closure. So in response to this, so pre-pandemic, uh, the government uh, started a program called the Holiday Activities and Food Program or HAF. Uh, this was primarily for children that received free school meals, but was intended to provide enriching activities when schools were closed. So ones that were healthy, active and safe, 
uh, that also provided food and some support for nutritional knowledge. And this was piloted in about no, in 17 areas in 2019. Now, there were no at least imminent plans to roll this out uh, at that point until COVID struck. And then uh, there was a, quite a huge public campaign to provide uh, foods to children when the, when, the, when the schools were shut. Now, most of you will remember that this was led by a campaign by Marcus Rashford, but some of you won't also know that it's actually started by a young person in her bedroom. So Christina Adain here in the middle with a lovely red suit on from her bedroom initiated a petition that was signed by over 430 people. And that was later picked up by Rashford in the press. So uh, I'm telling you this really to emphasize the power of the voice of young people. And I'll come back to this in a little bit later. And it was a success. So towards the end of 2020, the government announced that they would provide 220 million pounds to extend, extend the program for, for 2021. And so as part of our work on transforming the Yorkshire food system, we really felt that it was important to evaluate this program in order to justify any future spending or indeed not. So what I'm going to do now is very briefly talk, uh, talk to you about what we've done to, in that evaluation. So importantly, we felt that we had to do this really quickly. So we wanted to support decision making for the budget uh, last October. So we decided to do a very rapid evaluation, both of the implementation and of the impact of the programme. And we did this in partnership with an organisation called the Food Foundation. Now, this is a national organisation dedicated to changing food policy. We really wanted our learnings to have the best chance of making a difference, having an impact. And we started early engaging with local authorities across the whole region and uh, learning about their plans moving forward to implement the HAF programme. And then we focused an evaluation in four local authority areas. And we, we collected information in a number of different ways. So we started by asking each local authority to share all of their re relevant documents with us. So things like meeting minutes, uh, so that we could really get a good idea of what they were planning to do and what seemed to work or, or not work. And then we did something called a rapid participatory ethnography. So basically what this means is that members of the team volunteer to take part in programmes across the four local authority areas over the summer holidays. So they did lots of observations as well as obviously helping, helping to provide the, the activities. They observed interactions and they did lots of formal, informal chatting, sorry, with children. Uh, with parents and providers and then also during this period they had some more formal interviews that they held uh, with people that were planning and delivering the programs as well as hosting some some discussion groups with parents and then to supplement this we also conducted a national survey where we asked families to tell us about their experiences of the summer holiday period and all of this information all the data was combined to give us a really rich picture of how the programme was being implemented and whether it supported families as it intended to and what seemed to work best uh, and for whom. So just a snapshot of the findings then. So in terms of our implementation data, national, uh, the National Survey told us that about 23% of the fam uh, families that responded did experience some level of food insecurity and about 25% of the children attended a programme. But despite this very, very short lead in time that the local authorities had, they really stepped up to the challenge and we observed a, a huge range of programmes being delivered. So anything from horseshoe making, baking, football, archery, uh, uh, many more. Um, we did observe that for the most part, children tended to be 12 years, 12 years or younger. Um, so certainly in the future, more efforts are, um, are needed to engage older children. And the relationships that we built between the schools and the local authorities and that they built between themselves with the providers was absolutely key to success because the schools were the gateway also to the parents and the children. Uh, and this quote that I'm showing here uh, from one of our local authority representatives really sort of captures, captures this. So in terms of the impact then that it had on the families, um, Many children and parents told us that the children really enjoyed having a healthy meal and the opportunity to experience new foods. And actually, this was something that we observed quite regularly throughout the, the field work. The activities provided opportunities for children to be active, to socialise and to learn new skills. And there was a, a, an equality of opportunity as well for children to access uh, these activities. So 
Children that were eligible for free school meals attended the programme alongside children whose parents paid for them to attend. And there were many opportunities for them to socialise and to make friends with friends from, from their school and, and from, from other schools. And now many people told us felt this was absolutely essential, particularly after the period that they had of much reduced isolation because of COVID. We also found that whole families benefited from attending so that uh, parents could work over the over the school holiday. So parents commented that they would not have been able to afford to pay for such a programme, in which cases would have been more expensive than a than a day's earning. Um, these quotes here really just give a, a, an, an example of, of both of these things, uh, particularly the, the nice short one from the child here saying what the best part of, of the programme was. And then our findings, they were, they were consistent with the national food strategy. So this was published about the same time by Henry Dimbleby and he's shown here. This independent review made 14 recommendations of which the HAF programme was actually one of them. So armed with our data and our recommendations from the evaluation and this, and this review, uh, the food strategy, my team and I spent many, many hours sharing our learning. So we spoke to the Department for Environment and Rural Affairs, so DEFRA. We spoke to sh shadow cabinet ministers and to local authority leaders and the Department for Education, who told us that they would be making a recommendation for continued funding. And we also instigated quite a, a big uh, media campaign with support from the Food Foundation. And then in the autumn budget and spending review, it was announced that an additional 220 million pounds uh, was going to be made available to continue the HAF program. So we saw this as quite some impact. Now I did mention earlier that uh, this evaluation was part of a larger program of work called Fix Our Foods. So I'm just gonna give you a snapshot of, of this program. We focused on three key areas of innovation and testing. So the healthy eating for young children is within our early years and school settings. We're also focusing on hybrid business models. So these are uh, local food businesses that value social environmental aspects in addition to financial returns. And actually many of them only generate enough money to be sustainable. Uh, and there's also a focus on regenerative farming. And we're working across all these areas to make sure that the Yorkshire food system is sustainable. It, ben it benefits the population and it has planet and it benefits the planet as well. Uh, and this work is uh, being conducted with many relevant stakeholders, those from farming, industry uh, and policy. And there's a real strong focus as well on gathering data or metrics and on policy change. And then in terms of the early years and school subsystem, we have a vision in which tasty, good quality, sustainable food is the default and the easiest choice for all children. And this moves beyond the concept of simple uh, equity towards approaches which actually are going to be most beneficial to those needing it most. So making that individual decision making much easier, less complex. I just want to highlight our relationship with the Food Foundation. I've mentioned them before in this. They are key partners in Fix Our Food and are key link to our policy makers. They help us identify uh, relevant rapid responses, such as the HAF evaluation, and really do support dissemination to key leaders to make a difference. But also key to success of this are our young people, our leaders for change. And young people, as I'm sure you're aware, are quite passionate about climate change. Many of them really care about food systems as well. So we've recruited young people from seven primary and secondary schools across uh, Yorkshire, and they're helping us prioritise what they think is important, what they feel we should look at, how we should do that, and also helping us design innovations and interventions. So things like developing new school menus that both benefit planet and population. And I do want to acknowledge the team of people that have been involved in this evaluation, uh, including the Fix Our Food programme lead, Professor Bob Doherty. But I really thought it'd be best to let our young leaders for change have the last word. So thank you for listening to me and I'm now going to pass on to the young people to finish. Leaders for Change represents a group of young people from around schools all across Yorkshire. Young people who are really passionate about food and climate change and they are our voices for what changes they want to see in the food system because we could implement something all based on the evidence but if young people aren't going to respond to it 
then it's not going to work. As a school we're really passionate about climate justice and what we can do to help the environment. So we've come here to kind of see what we can do and see what other schools are doing. I was very interested about how much impact beef had because at school we have beef like nearly every day. So I think introducing more of those options would be really good to almost encourage people that you don't need to have as much meat as you do. The first thing I think they should do is introduce vegan foods and also like reduce amount of plastic. If we introduce a bit more vegetables and fruits to our uh, dinners, it might help people realise that there's not just meat in the world, there are other foods that they can eat. In the future, I would like our country to become more dependable, growing its own fruit and vegetables, and we want to move towards having biodegradable yeah. lunch packaging. We've tried to like change our cutlery into like wooden cutlery, because obviously as a generation, it's up to us to make a change.